Hi, my name's Ian Wright, and I'm going to talk to you today. I'm an osteopath, by the way, and I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about cerebral palsy and the potential osteopathic management of that. Um, it's World Cerebral Palsy Day um, in the next day or so, and I just thought I'd um, have a little chat about this um, because I've spent the last 25 years working a lot with children with various degrees um, and various different types of cerebral palsy. And I lecture a lot on this um, in lots of different places. So cerebral palsy is, I suppose you can term it as a group of disorders and they're permanent. They're not, they're not transient, they're, they're actually there and they're there for life normally. Um, but I'll talk more about that actually at the end. And they tend to most of all affect movement, motion and motor skills, especially muscle tone. So they're more, they affect function, function, motor function of the body. Um, but it can also affect sensation, um, the ability to, to sense. It depends on what parts of the brain are affected. Hearing, swallowing, eyesight. But also it can, you can have other issues which... I will talk about a little bit with regards to our osteopathic management of those. But, for example, reflux is very high. Um, scoliosis, which is a lateral curvature of the spine, can come and can really develop very quickly at certain stages, which I'll talk about. Um, seizure disorders um, is very common. About 30% of them, uh, of the children that we would see and overall w would have seizure disorders to varying degrees and types. Of course, in some cases, there's intellectual disability and learning difficulties. And also, there can be secondary effects like chest infection tendencies, immune problems, weakness in, in the function of the immune system, which we'll talk about. But actually, two of the biggest areas that aren't so talked about in um, cerebral palsy are pain. And pain is... It's very hard because a lot of the children that we, that we manage and we treat cannot say that they're in pain. And it's very hard. It's a constant battle with parents to, to understand if everything's okay or if your child, the child is in pain. Also, pain affects sleep. So pain and sleep are two very big issues, which I think that the scope for us as osteopaths to be helpful with. Um, what causes cerebral palsy? This is, I mean, it's, there's a variety of things that could cause it, but more, most often it is caused by damage to the brain in utero or around birth, especially actually in utero with prematurity. Usually it's to do with the blood supply, which is either too little or too much, but actually usually it's both. Often it starts with hypoxia, which is too little, um, and then you get a swelling. There's an overreaction of the, the uh, vascular system where they flood the brain and that actually often causes the most damage, the swelling, um, the edema. And it can cause things like um, periventricular leukomalacia. These are kind of degenerative changes that happen because of this. Um, there are different types of cerebral palsy, different, and also when I'm lecturing, this is quite interesting, you should often be able to tell when the insult occurred in the brain by what's affected. You know, normally say a, a, a child that had some sort of um, low blood supply hypoxic reaction at say 26 to 28 weeks, the legs are primarily involved because that's when those tracts of the brain are developing. Um, from 28 to 30 weeks, it's normally the upper extremities. These are more of the short tracts, which are closer. Over 30 weeks, it's often the trunk muscles involved. But actually, a lot of the children that we see, everything's involved. Um, in the earlier stages, in a premature baby, it's normally um, these kind of watershed areas, which are areas where which are the furthest distance from the heart, from the blood supply. They're the kind of end of the vascular supply. And that's true in actually strokes as when people get older. Um, these watershed areas are areas that are the first to kind of have minimal blood supply. And interestingly, they 
supply areas around the corticospinal tracts, which are to do with the long motor tracts which govern arm and leg and trunk function. A lot of the babies that we see, actually, there is a blood supply issue around the birth. If the, you know, With a baby, they're getting their oxygen via the umbilical cord. And if the cord is blocked or the cord is around the neck or there's, there's trauma or distress or the blood supply or the placenta comes away too early, all these different things, and there's no blood supply and they haven't taken a first breath, they're going to have a problem with the blood supply and we need a constant oxygenation of our tissues for them to survive. So then it can be much more strong in, in areas of the effect like the brainstem, etc. Now, CP can affect hemiplegia, which can be one side only, or it can be biplegia. Um, it can affect one extremity, like the arm, or diplegic, both the arm and the leg. Or it can have, and we often see this, quadriplegia, which where it's affecting both arms and legs. And it's graded usually one to three, three being the most severe. Now, I just want to talk about where osteopathy comes because, I mean, I can, we can talk about this uh, <laughs> forever, but where osteopathy comes in, because you'd think, actually, I remember one of, one of our students saying to, to one of the mothers um, at the, the Daisy Clinic, which is a charity clinic that we run in rural Ireland, um, where we treat a lot of um, children um, and manage the children with cerebral palsy, um, and he asked the mother, well, what can you do for these children? And, and I just passed him over to the mother of one of the children who was there who spent 25 minutes explaining what we've helped, <laughs> which was amazing, actually. Um, but there's a lot of different things that we can do that can be supportive. We, you know, this, is no, this is no curative thing because this is a, a permanent disorder, but we can be helpful. And there are certain windows of opportunity that can be really, I think, very, very important. The first thing is... We want to treat babies as young as possible if they've had trauma because what I'm interested in in my work as a cranial osteopath is freedom of movement of the nervous system. So when there is damage to the brain, it locks up the tissue. The tissue stops moving. There's also, there's, what's interesting is there is tissue necrosis, as in the tissue that is not functioning anymore, that's almost dead tissue, but there's tissue all around it which just locks up and is shocked and is not moving. Now that's the tissue I'm interested in. And because of this wonderful ability of the brain to be plastic, it's neuroplasticity it's called, it's an incredible way that the brain actually is wiring itself up and it's covering itself with myelination, with, with myelin sheaths, which is a kind of fatty covering, which is very important in nerve function. So these two elements are happening from pre-birth up to, well, actually up to a, a very late, um, sort of mid-teens in certain areas of the brain, actually up to the early 20s. Um, and actually, plasticity of the brain happens all the time. When we say, for example, when we're learning a new language or we're creating a memory, that actually there is a formation of the synapses, a, a wiring, a connecting of parts of the brain. And actually, brain tissue actually can grow even in adults. But those particular parts of the brain um, that are not are more involved with memory, etc., etc., and then not so much involved in plasticity later in life. So what we're really looking at is this plasticity of the brain in a baby who has had damage, and the key time for that is between 0 and 4 years old, because after 4, the, the, certainly the, the long tracts of, of the, the motor tracts, the corticospinal tract, etc., have myelinated and there is a littler chance of this kind of synaptic wiring happening. So what we want to do is free up movement of areas that blocked. I do this actually in um, work with, with adults post-stroke CVAs as well to help with this kind of free up areas that have, have been blocked and I think that um, people report lots of certainly help in certain areas but in children to me it's a window if we free everything up as much as we can, we're going to maximise potential. And that's what, we're, what's, what it's all about with, with, with children with CP, I think. It is 
its potential. Um, anyway, that's a that's a huge subject, and um, I'll come back to that another time. But there are other areas which I think are very important for us when we're trying to work with children um, with cerebral Oste osteopathy is a has a wide variety of techniques. I mean, I'm talking here about these very gentle cranial type techniques, but with cerebral palsy children in the clinic, we actually want to do stronger, more structural techniques. We want to do stretching because of this, this very high kind of rigidity, actually, of the muscles, which can cause a lot of problems. We need to stretch them out. We need to work on these muscles, you know, which is actually physio is extremely good for as well. And we work often alongside physios. And the phys physiotherapy is absolutely key, I think, in, in the management of, of cerebral palsy as well. Um, so we want to do this kind of feedback through the muscle groups, stretch out certain things and do some particular structural kind of techniques to help. Um, but there are challenges. There are certain challenges which are key challenges in a cerebral palsy child. Um, one is growth. When you, when you start growing through key kind of growth times, like for example, seven, eight years old, or 12, 13 years old, these are kind of particular growth spurt times, especially the kind of adolescent one, where imbalances in the kind of muscle tone of the body can have big effects and can, you can develop this scoliosis because you've got an imbalance between the muscle groups in the posture, and that's very, very important. Um, because the nervous system is blocked up and the, the, the body is growing, often there are certain key growth points when seizure disorders can come and seizure disorders can become accentuated. So what we want to do is keep everything as free as it can be to minimalize that kind of thing. We're often working with chest function to help with tendency to chest infections or with the diaphragm function when there's tendency to reflux so there's a there's a there's a, 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 so many different things and and it's an a, you know it's a huge um area for for when i'm teaching because we cover so many parts of, of osteopathy when we're working with children with cerebral palsy what we it's all about is maximizing potential that's what we're into, into, seeing as if this child can be as free as possible and not forgetting, more, very importantly, management of pain and helping with sleep. If we can free them up, then they won't be so rigid, so tight and so agitated in the nervous system. And hopefully it will help with things like sleep and pain management. Anyway, that's an introduction. It's, it's a big subject. Um, we have the, the DAISY clinic, if, if you, you have a child that, that is affected by this, which is a low-cost charity-based clinic um, in Tipperary, Ireland. And we're welcome to, to take on any children who have that, that um, particular problem there and just give us a call at the practice. Um, that's um, clonmelosteopaths.ie is the website. Thank you.